What's going on, everybody? RJ Ochoa here from SB Nation's bloggingtheboys.com. Hope all is well, wherever you are. Hope you're happy, safe, healthy, and that you're enjoying all of the sporting action happening across the world right now. We've got the College World Series going on. My Aggies making it as of Wednesday night. Very exciting sort of thing. We've got Copa America getting started. We've got the Euros. Uh, Shout out to Scotland for Wednesday's draw coming off that first match that we don't have to talk about. Shout out to my boy, Paul Stewart, who hooked me up with this particular kid. Everybody go listen to the world's team between Paul and Mike Poland. Um, Helping us get to football season, obviously. We've got about five weeks, a little bit under five weeks to go, uh, as I lower the volume on my other computer over here. A little under five weeks to go until the Dallas Cowboys report to training camp. We actually discussed during the last video that I did here on the Blog and the Boys YouTube channel, where if you have not subscribed, you are, well, making me sad. Make sure to subscribe here to the Blog of the Boys YouTube channel, the most subscribed to individual team channel across all of the SB Nation universe. My name, RJ Ochoa, as mentioned. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or threads at RJ Ochoa or on TikTok at RJ.Ochoa. Email is RJ.Ochoa at SBNation.com, or you can leave a comment down below, and I'll do my best to get to those all throughout the course of forever. Uh, but I'm here on the channel all the time talking all things Dallas Cowboys. That's my job here at BTP, and that's what I love to do, and I appreciate those of you who love to do it with me. We are here for the latest installment of our Dallas Cowboys roster breakdown series, taking a look at each position group on the Cowboys in the lead-up to training camp. And as I mentioned the last video that I did, I'll put the link to the description, or rather, I will put to the, if I could use words, I've got my cup of coffee here while I take a sip. In the description down below, I will put the links, as I have been doing, to every single video that we've done so far in the lead up, obviously, to it all being over. I don't know. Words are very difficult for me at this point in time. So far, we've done the quarterbacks. We've done the backfield. We did wide receivers earlier this week. Today is obviously tight ends. I say today. It's Thursday, June the 20th. Um, Next week, we will uh, continue on. But these drop every Tuesday and Thursday between now and training camp. Just a heads up. Today is tight ends. Appropriately so, because tight end unit. University was happening this week out in Nashville. Uh, so very cool to see the leagues, you know, prominent, well-known, even not so well-known tight ends gathering in the name of helping one another. Dallas Cowboys tight ends, Jake Ferguson and Luke Schoonmaker, who we're going to talk about for a bit here, uh, were in attendance, as was quarterback Dak Prescott. I found that to be very interesting. Uh, it's notable, certainly, that Dak is going to be there to support his guys. If you are wondering why, uh, Greg Olson was on Pardon My Take recently. I wrote about this whole thing uh, at BTB, so you can go check out the links to everything at blogontheboys.com. You should, by the way, I will be writing about this subject at blogontheboys.com, so make sure to check that out. But um, Greg Olson on PMT, uh, it was like a week ago, week and a half ago, mentioned that they like having you know quarterbacks in attendance so that they can work with the tight ends and let them know you know, what quarterbacks are looking for, you know, in in certain plays and on certain routes, things like that. So it all makes sense. It's very cool. Uh, Again, another opportunity, obviously, for Dak to get work in with his tight ends. We all, um, I think, have some questions about Luke Schoonmaker. So the more work that Dak can get with him, certainly the best. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's take a look at where is my little click here. Here we go. So let me put this view on for you. These are the Cowboys tight ends as things currently stand. With training camp about five weeks away, the Cowboys' official report date in Oxnard, California, is July 24th. Jake Ferguson, the unquestioned starter of this team, really coming onto the scene last year. I did not believe personally. I think a lot of people believed because they wanted to. It happened to work out, so congratulations to you if you knew that Jake Ferguson was going to be a baller. Primary depth. You will note that I have placed. This is my particular you know, sort of adjustment. I have placed Luke Schoonmaker in the tight end two slot. Uh, I'll explain why as we kind of walk through here. Peyton Hendershot, who we I felt I think all thought in 2022 was going to kind of be Jake Ferguson's running mate, sort of the bash brother, you know, that he sort of needed, um, but didn't necessarily see that translate in their sophomore season together. John Stevens Jr., don't forget, was a very, very impressive name as an undrafted free agent a year ago throughout training camp in the early part of their preseason, tore his ACL in the same game that DeMarvion Overshone did, and the Cowboys were not able to utilize him at all throughout his rookie season. Brevin Spanford is a name to know. We will get there, speaking of UDFA rookies he's the one to watch this particular season out of minnesota the more category princeton fan alec holler um it's going to be tough enough for the the gentleman in the primary depth category to make this team not all of them obviously but uh princeton fan alec holler will be some names that we obviously get to know throughout the course of the preseason so let's get started and take a look at jake ferguson here who is 
a baller. And I noted that I did not believe last year. I did not necessarily think that this was going to translate into something significant. I think a lot of people just wanted it to. I think a lot of people say, well, Dalton Schultz is gone. Jake Ferguson is in. He's going to be awesome. I did not jump on that bandwagon. I was slow to it. I'm sorry, Jake. I'm sorry, Jake Ferguson. I'm sorry, Fergie. He's got a lot of nicknames. He was awesome. He was incredible last year. And I don't think that we have properly contextualized just how good he was. Now, he had only five touchdowns last year, which is you know not meant to sound like a demerit or an indictment or anything like that. Um, but he had a lot of production from a yardage standpoint. And I was so curious because like I said, I do these videos and I write articles about the subject, obviously, in our roster breakdown series. And I wanted to kind of understand exactly what Jake Ferguson did this past year uh, for the Cowboys. So let's take a look at this year. This is every tight end in Dallas Cowboys franchise history who had at least 750 receiving yards in a single season. So again, I'm going to repeat it. These are just tight ends. So this is excluding wide receivers or running backs or any other position. These are just tight ends who had at least 750 receiving yards in a single season. You see, and we're going in descending order from a time perspective here, Jake Ferguson up at the very top, 2023, had 761. 750 was my cutoff you know, for obvious reasons. He had the five touchdowns that we noted. It was not as robust of a season as Dalton Schultz in 2021, which led the Cowboys, obviously, to kind of figure things out and franchise tag and all that conversation. And I don't know that we gave Dalton Schultz enough credit, enough due, enough respect, because he had a fine season in year one with the Houston Texans, and the Cowboys aren't necessarily missing him or anything like that. Um, but, you know, they obviously found a, a suitable replacement in Jake Ferguson, and Dalton Schultz is succeeding elsewhere. Everybody is happy. That being said, this list is dominated by Jason Wooden. I mean, look at that. That four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year run. 2004, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, ten years in a row. Jason Witten had at least 750 receiving yards for the Dallas Cowboys. Not a ton of seasons with you know an enormous amount of production from a scoring perspective, but who cares? I mean, and I wrote about this in the article, and it hasn't come out yet. It will um, at some point as the weekend kind of unfolds. But I was so interested, and I talked about this a lot in the podcast you know, network at the time, and still under construction, still trying to figure that out, and here on the YouTube channel, basically anywhere that I was behind a microphone or a keyboard, something I noted in 2020 when the Dallas Cowboys moved on from Jason Wynn after he'd come back for the year in 2019 after spending a season in the Monday Night Football booth. I was so interested to see how the Dallas Cowboys are going to kind of figure out a new world because for a long time, they didn't have to live like the rest of the NFL, right? When you find somebody like this, you know, tight end is if you play fantasy football, I think this is this is one of the few things in fantasy football that translates to real football. If you don't have one of the premier premium top quality dudes, you're Travis Kelsey, George Kittle, you know, every now and then we've had, you know, people kind of float into that space, whether it was Darren Waller with the Raiders or Jonu Smith in that little spell with the Titans, right? Like you have those those dudes who kind of get hot for a little bit. But if you don't have one of those guys, you are it's just, just a massive gap, right? It's the very, very, very small elite one percent and then everybody else. And so I was very interested to see how the Cowboys, you know, not that Jason Witten was ever Travis Kelsey or, or George Kittle or Gronk or Jimmy Graham, you get my point, but he was a highly, highly, highly productive player. So it was going to be very interesting to see how, you know, they approached it like mortals and they've done a great job. I mean, let me put the list back up on here for you because this is really impressive to me. The fact that they had Witten so long, so long, so long, so long, and then, you know, a little bit of drop off, you know, the last few years of Witten, you know, the last time Jason Witten did this, at least was 2013. It's not a coincidence, I don't think that this coincides with Des Bryant really evolving and then the drafting of Zeke Elliott and then, you know, a few different things and whatever. But you get my point. And so, so that the Cowboys were able to think about it prior to Jason Witten. Only one person had ever done this one time, and it was Doug Cosby in 1985. I mean, forever ago. I mean, like, so you're talking about a very, very, very long time ago that this had happened one time. And since Jason Witten left, and, and the beginning of Jason Witten's departure, remember, was 2020. It coincided with, with Mike McCarthy's arrival. You're talking about 2020, one, two, and three. That's four total seasons. And twice, two in those four seasons, twice in those four seasons, the Cowboys have managed to do this with two different players, which I think underscores that we 
we're not giving enough credit to a lot of people, uh, namely the the players involved, Jake Ferguson and Delton Schultz, but also the offensive play callers because this involves two different ones. Kellen Moore obviously oversaw Dalton Schultz uh, in that 2021 season and Mike McCarthy in 2023. And I don't know, maybe the quarterback, uh, Dak Prescott, who's kind of good at this. I mean, again, just my two cents here. But Jake Ferguson is awesome if that you know hasn't been noted, hasn't been properly documented. Um, is he in that 1%? No. No. I do think that we kind of live in a world now where there's that 1% and then there's a big gap and then there's the dudes like Jake Ferguson and then there's another gap and then there's the field. Um, so Jake Ferguson's kind of there. Maybe you want to put Dawson Knox there. Maybe you want to put Dalton Kincaid there. You know, pick your Bills tight end. Maybe you want to put, um, you know, David Njoku has some great moments, obviously. there. I mean, I'm not here to rank NFL tight ends, but you get my my point here. And Jake Ferguson is definitely, he's in that camp with Dalton Schultz, I think. He's, he's kind of... Dallas got it right like he's he's in that camp and he's coming off an incredibly impressive season um I mean 102 targets for Jake Ferguson he is a tried and true legitimate part of what the Dallas Cowboys do offensively and I don't see that changing obviously anytime soon so good for Jake Ferguson good for the Cowboys good for Dak Prescott good for everybody involved uh let's get to number two on our list and that is Luke Schoon Maker now it is a bummer to be going into the second season of a second round picks career for the Dallas Cowboys in the NFL and to kind of have no expectations, right? To kind of, you know, feel like nothing's really going to come of this. Um, unfortunately, this is pretty normal for, <laughs> for, for us as Dallas Cowboys fans in terms of, um, you know, low expectations through the second season of a second round pick. Uh, I was pulling open, uh, Luke Schoonmaker's PFR page. Let me get this going for you so you can see this because this is um this won't make you feel good. Uh as I pull this up, here we are. Let's see, here we go. Um, this is Luke Schoonmaker and his rookie season with the Dallas Cowboys. Let me get this properly centered for you. I think we're good. Let me put myself down below. Nah, I don't like that. I'll put myself back up here. Okay, so he had three targets one time once he had two targets two other instances other than that one target was kind of par for the course here you can see the total numbers at the bottom if i scroll down a little bit 15 total targets his rookie season eight total ca uh, receptions excuse me and two touchdowns the one we remember the most is the touchdown he didn't catch right there or the, the reception he had that wasn't a touchdown at the one inch line in philadelphia He had a foot issue about a year ago. He had shoulder surgery along with Mozzie Smith at the beginning of the offseason. And he had hamstring issue throughout OTAs. He obviously was a part of, you know, tight end university, which is cool. But he, you know, he carries some question marks. And I don't know how you can feel good about him right now. I don't know how you can feel anything about him. But I think what you can sort of bet on this is a funny photo now that i look at it he's not doesn't the ball isn't even like technically in his hands i hadn't quite realized that when i when i set this up you can always follow the money in, in the nfl and and by that you can you can discern a lot of things and you can discern that because he is a second year second round draft pick of the dallas cowboys luke schoonmaker is going to get any and every opportunity to prove the Dallas Cowboys right. When you're when you're a high priced, high, you know, premium asset draft pick, whatever you want to call it, you have a big free agency contract, whatever, you are given the, maybe the better way to put it is you're given way more opportunities to prove them wrong or to prove them right. I don't even know what I'm speaking of now. I've still got my coffee, but Luke Schoonmaker has a much less steep climb towards making the roster. He's making the roster, I mean, obviously, but I mean, that's my point, right? He's He's got a lot of kind of cachet because of his, you know, pedigree, so to speak. He's he, He's got an easier path than, say, Peyton Hendershot. You may believe that Peyton Hendershot's a better player. I think that's an exaggeration at this point in time, but you get my point. Luke Schoomaker is going to be given every opportunity, not only just to make the roster, which, again, is, is a silly conversation to have about the second year, second round pick, unless you're talking about somebody like Kelvin Joseph, but um, He's going to be given every opportunity to prove them right on the field, 
right? That's why the, the top two tight ends on this team, you, you better accept it now, are Jake Ferguson and Luke Schoonmaker. And hopefully Schoonmaker develops into the player that the Cowboys evaluated and obviously ultimately selected in the second round of the 2023 NFL draft. Um, it is funny that the season we just gave Jake Ferguson an, enorm an enormous amount of flowers for came on the heels uh, of drafting Schoonmaker in the second round. Um, but it is what it is, I suppose. Um, there really isn't a lot to say about Schoonmaker other than he's going to be given every chance because the Cowboys spent a second round pick on him. So that takes us to a different sort of question, and that is who will be tight end three? Because as we go back and we take a look at the overall list here, Schoonmaker's tight end two. We've established this. We know this. This isn't up for debate. All right. Is Peyton Hendershot not going to make the list? He's a third-year undrafted free agent. He's not making a ton of money, obviously. It's not like, you know, the Cowboys can, you know, have some sort of cap relief by moving on from him. But do they want to move on? Do they, I mean, think, when you're in your third year in the NFL, you know, all of a sudden you're not the, the bright, shiny new toy anymore, right? Like, all of a sudden you're, you know, you're somebody who can be replaced. And John Stevens Jr. is somebody who Stephen Jones has mentioned several times, Brevin Span 4. We're going to get to in a moment here. But it's my humble opinion, and I don't enjoy this part of, you know, this line of work, obviously. Um, it's my humble opinion that Peyton Hendershot could be the odd man out because he has not necessarily just younger players behind him, but younger players who the team seemingly you know, values for the team seemingly is interested in. And I guess to have this conversation about Peyton Hendershot, we have to have it about everybody. So this is John Stevens Jr. here. I mean, super impressive red zone, vertical threat, you know, last year at training camp in the early part of the preseason. And like I said, been gassed up a lot by, you know, the brain trust of the team so far this off season. And so you have to kind of figure they're going to, they're going to be really interested to see what he offers in that respect. And do you think of Peyton Hendershot as like a vertical red zone weapon? And I'm, I'm not saying he can't fill that role, but I mean, if I, John Stevens Jr. is a mouthful, let's go JSJ here. Um, little Jackson Smith and Jigba um, kind of vibes uh, from a name standpoint. But JSJ, to me, seems like he will be given deference over Peyton Hendershot because he offers something that is really valuable, right? You're a red zone weapon. All of a sudden, you know, what's the point of the game to score more points than the other team. And so um, you have to obviously, you know, work as a blocker, work on the line, you know, do the dirty work when you're tied in three on an NFL roster. Um, but it seems like John Stevens Jr. may offer something that Peyton Hendershot simply doesn't. At the very least, he offers an upside that we have now established through two seasons of Peyton Hendershot, who, remember, the Peyton Hendershot, who only played in eight games last year. So again, kind of a, an indication that the, you know, the team may not necessarily be prioritizing him a ton. Um, and uh, reportedly had a medical procedure, Dallas Cowboys.com reported around the start of minicamp. Not that that's a big deal. It was uh, reported to be a minor, minor medical thing. But still, my point is the the lure of John Stevens Jr. is something that might, you know, see him surpass Peyton Hendershot uh, in terms of opportunity and therefore in terms of a potential spot on the roster. So let's say that John Stevens Jr. does make the team. It's not uncommon for NFL teams to carry four. Could Peyton Hendershot make the team? I don't know, because Brevin Spanford exists. Now, Brevin Spanford, if you don't know anything about him, uh, coming out of Minnesota, um, was regarded to be one of the better blocking tight ends in the draft class. Obviously, the Cowboys didn't draft one because uh, they spent a second-round pick on one last year. But they notably made Brevin Spanford among the highest-paid undrafted free agents in the entire UDFA class across the NFL. What does that mean, RJ? Well, here's the thing. After the NFL draft is over, there are undrafted free agents. Duh. You know this, right? And the Dallas Cowboys have a long and storied, you know, kind of 21st century tradition of landing prominent undrafted free agents. And, and you could go super saying with this, Tony Romo, Miles Austin. I mean, there are some, some incredible people, but there's also role players and significant role players, right? I mean, just last year, the Cowboys found Brandon Aubrey as an undrafted free agent. Now, technically, um, obviously, he was playing you know spring football. It's a little bit different, but you get my point, Kevontae Turpin. I mean, right? Like, there's all these players who the Cowboys have identified and ultimately brought in as undrafted free agents, and they like that part of roster construction. And how can you blame them when they have the history that they do? So that being said, during the undrafted free agent process, there's obviously no draft picks that are spent on these players, but you can sign them to money. Like, that's the whole point. And the money is negotiable. And the Cowboys gave Brevin Spanford more than most, literally any other undrafted free agent across the entire NFL, as mentioned. What can we discern from that? I told you a little while ago, you follow the money. What we can discern, it isn't necessarily, you know, 
dot connecting dot, you know, this is a fact, whatever. I'm not telling you to leap to a conclusion, but what we can discern is the Dallas Cowboys did not want to lose Brevin Spanforth. That's why they paid him so much money relative to the context of what we're discussing here. We can also discern that that suggests that he has a high likelihood of making the roster, right? They, you know, it is just money and they're the wealthiest professional sports franchise in the world. Uh, but they likely believed that he had the chance to make the roster which is why they were willing to you know devote some some more serious cash to him relative to any other undrafted free agent across the nfl and that kind of takes us back to the luke schoonmaker conversation he's going to be given more opportunities to prove them right he's going to have to prove them wrong to really kind of play his way off of the roster as opposed to somebody like peyton hendershot who's now fighting against he's in his own third nfl season john stevens jr is kind of the apple of everybody's eye and brevin span ford is a great blocker which is what you have to be obviously when you're this far down the roster and so again when you kind of work the amalgamation of everything it seems like Peyton Hendershot as noted here may be the odd man out that's just my humble opinion here and I feel badly because Peyton Hendershot's been a nice player for the Cowboys for two years but the numbers kind of are what they are at this point in time and so if I had to predict right now this isn't a 53-man roster prediction but if I did put one together I would say that my four tight ends on the team because I would be carrying four would obviously be Jake Ferguson and Luke Schoonmaker and then I would guess it's going to be John Stevens Jr. and Brevin Span Ford. Princeton fan and Alec Collar as we talked about at the beginning at the top you know, names that will certainly be around throughout training camp in the preseason. Uh, but, I mean, it goes without saying that the four players or three players, if the Cowboys go, you know, shy here, uh, are going to be found from the first two columns. Um, and at the very least, two of the three or four are going to be Jake Ferguson and Luke Schoonmaker. So I would say that the the third highest likelihood of making the team, if there are only three, is probably John Stevens Jr. Maybe the Cowboys at that point in time, you know, stash Brevin Span Ford on, you know, the practice squad they try to and there's obviously always you know different you know roster stashing techniques or things that happen you know unfortunately players get injured in the case of john stevens jr the cowboys put him on injured reserve last year so they didn't have to worry about him but now here we are it's been another year and they've got to kind of put this puzzle back together once again from an overall roster standpoint and so um those are my four i do think that peyton hendershot is the odd man out but obviously time will ultimately be um time will ultimately tell and be the story of what we wind up seeing happening i don't know words have gotten to be very difficult for me as i mentioned this is our roster breakdown series my roster breakdown series here on the blog of the boys youtube channel if you haven't yet please please por favor subscribe to the blog of the boys youtube channel the most subscribed to individual team channel across all of the sb nation universe also it'd be cool if you like the video down below i don't know it'd be cool if you left a comment it'd be cool if you just told a friend sent it to a friend whatever the case may be those things uh really help and really go a long way um i know that it is um kind of cliche internet influencer whatever to ask for them but uh, i ask humbly if that makes uh, a little bit of a difference as noted our roster series is continuing all throughout the lead up to training camp which begins on or the report date is rather july 24th uh, up next, next Tuesday. What is Tuesday? Today is uh, the 20th. So Friday is the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, the 25th, right? June 25th. Uh, June 25th, it will be the offensive line here on the Blog of the Boys YouTube channel. So looking forward to that video and breaking down some of the newbies on the team. Tyler Guyton, Cooper BB uh, will be a very good time. My name, if you forgot, is RJ Ochoa. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or threads at RJ Ochoa or on TikTok at RJ.Ochoa. If you would like to send me an email, you can do so, RJ. Ocho at SBNation.com, or you can leave a comment down below, and I will do my very best to get to those as well. Want a big, uh, want to give a big uh, shout out, thank you to Bear, who was under the desk the entire video and did not bark. So, congratulations to him, especially because we're getting close to mail time, which means I'm going to have to get out of here. With that being said, I hope you have a wonderful day. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Hope you enjoy all the sports, all the food, all the life, whatever you got going. I hope it is incredible. Thanks so much for hanging out, everybody. We'll see you next time.